Amen. Can we thank our ringers for uh, beginning our worship for us? Good morning, church. What a joy it is to gather in worship together as God's people. Uh, my name is Grace Hahn. I'm the pastor here at Trinity, and we're so glad that we're able to worship together, uh, both in person as well as online. I want to extend a special welcome if it's your first time worshiping with us or it's been a while. It is so glad. Uh, I am so glad, and it is a joy to be able to gather together. Uh, today, as we continue our sermon series on uh, how the Holy Spirit is poured upon all of us, today we're going to get a glimpse of how the Holy Spirit is at work in our church uh, today. We're going to hear a wonderful sermon led by Hannah Day Donahue, our program director. Uh, we're going to celebrate the reconciling ministries and the commitment that Trinity has made to be an inclusive church. Uh, we're going to have a chance to recognize one of the great uh, elders and ministers of our church. It is truly going to be a spirit-filled church, and I'm so glad we're able to celebrate that together. So as we continue in our worship today, I want to invite you to join me for the call to worship. You'll see it both printed uh, in your bulletins. Uh, if you are in person, we'll invite you to stand where you are. Uh, if you are online, the response is may all we say and do be the seeds that increase inclusivity. Let us join together in our call to worship. Friends, today we celebrate that all persons are created in the image of God. May we remember where we have been in our history and where we have come in our present. Today, we commit in our worship to continue to quarrel with what is in our world and church so that we can continue as partners in what might be. May all we say and do be the seeds that increase inclusivity. Let us join together in our opening hymn, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above.
gather uh, as God's people. And one of the things that we do when we gather and worship is to share in a prayer of confession and pardon. Uh, during this season of Pentecost, we've been mixing it up a little bit. We've been doing different prayers of confession and pardon that meet uh, the, the realities of our time. Uh, this is a prayer of confession and pardon written by our uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Uh, Yutha Hardman Cromwell. I invite you to join me in praying this aloud. You thought you look confused because this was a prayer of confession that you wrote last year that we wanted to incorporate into our worship service today. So you did not write it this week and forget about it. <laughs> Let us join together in prayer. Creator God, you have entrusted to us a marvelous planet Earth that sustains and astonishes us. Your creation mystifies and challenges us to comprehend all that you are and all that you call us to be. You have entrusted to us the care of all your creation, including the variety of human expression that often confronts our instinct for uniformity. Forgive us for valuing uniformity over your value of diversity and unity. You include all in your circle of love and care. Open us to the needs of those with whom we differ, caring about them as we care about our own needs. Forgive us for not loving ourselves so that we are enabled to love others. Help us to respond with all the power we possess your love of all of us as an expression and example of our thankfulness for your love of us. We pray together. Amen. And now knowing that we are a forgiven and reconciled people, I invite you to uh, turn to one another to offer each other signs of grace and peace. If you're worshiping online with us, please say hello in the chat feature. Register your attendance with us. Let us pass God's peace. I invite you to be seated. Oh, you already knew this. <laughs> uh, this morning, we are incredibly blessed to just have a moment of recognition for the ministry and service of uh, the Reverend Dr. Yutha Hardman Cromwell. And we're going to have a more formal presentation, but I just want to name, when I first was appointed to Trinity uh, five years ago, uh, my DS gave me all of the kind of the stats and everything. And then he said, and also as an aside, you know that Yutha is there because Yutha has such a reputation for being such a support and encouragement of clergy, uh, and that has always meant so much uh, to me personally. But before I get too far ahead of myself, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mary Beth Buchholz, who's going to share just a little bit about Yutha's ministry and service uh, here at Trinity. And there is a mic. Here we go. Good morning, church. Good morning, Yutha. It is such an honor to stand before our church and before you to celebrate you. Um, many of you have, have uh, known Yutha as a, as a part of our church before you even arrived. Um, but today, in part, we are celebrating because Yutha goes from being a Washington, D.C. resident to coming back to Virginia. Uh, it, over the past year or so, they have built a house uh, in the family farm in Orange, Virginia. And so, upon selling the house that she and Oliver had together in Washington, D.C., now she is making Orange, Virginia. This is kind of a welcome back. It's home again. It's home again. But this is home. This is church home. I want to underscore this is church home. So I did a little GPS calculating this morning. 
and I think I'm right, if you were leaving your house and coming here from Washington, D.C. here, it was 7.8 miles according to the GPS. Now, I think I have this right, it's 82 miles. Okay, so lesson number one, if any of you ever think there's a moment that it's like, it's too late, it's too far to come to church, I want you to remember that Yutho is on the road and on her way here before any of us even jumped in a shower. So think about that. Um, I have had a privilege over the last several months of talking to a lot of you, a lot of people in the Virginia Conference about what the UMC and what Trinity in particular means to them. And uh, there's not one conversation that I've had that didn't include a testimony as to your impact upon the parishioners and the life of the Virginia Conference. And um, I really do look forward to sharing more of it with you in the days to come. But I do believe it was Melanie Modlin who summed it up best. Melanie Modlin describes you as a tidal wave for good. Um, I know that you describe yourself first and foremost as a teacher and many of you may not know that long before um, you that pursued the ministry formally she did feel the calling at 16 but there was no pathway for women um, in a lot of the denominations but certainly within the Baptist church that she was um, had grown up in and if not for uh, really looking at those roadblocks and saying, I'm going to overcome those, I am going to follow the, the work and the will of God, um, she later went on to pursue uh, her Master's of Divinity and PhD, first at Howard University. And ultimately, the teaching went full circle because she was a professor at Wesley Seminary um, but you have been a teacher to all of us, and um, that is so felt um, in so many ways. And I promised myself that I was not going to cry through this. I'm not going to cry. No crying. No um, crying. But I, I did want to share um, more to come about the wonders of, of Yutha. I promised you that, so come back next week. But as you now make Orange your home during the week and return here during, on Sundays, uh, we just wanted to give you a celebration and a housewarming gift for you and, youth, or you and Deborah and the rest of your family to enjoy in the, the days and weeks and years to come. Give me a We love you. This is much more than I expected. Well, you are much more than we expected. So don't worry, we're not done yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not done yet. Yeah, yeah. One more thing. So as uh, Mary Beth has said, um, Yutha has been part of our Trinity congregation for 30 plus years. Uh, she is an ordained clergy person in our, in, uh, started in Baltimore Washington Conference and Virginia Conference. Um, and her primary appointment was as a professor at Wesley Theological Seminary, uh, but she has always held her secondary appointment to this local congregation here at Trinity. And I know it's been a very important part of who Yutha is to have a claim to a local church. And we have been so incredibly blessed uh, by her presence and her leadership here. Many of you know Yutha has led um, courageous conversations around LGBTQ inclusion, around racial reconciliation here at Trinity, and really paved the foundation 
foundation for us as a church. So we are so grateful for you. And like Mary Beth said, this is not goodbye. This is not a farewell. This is a celebration of the ministries. But we also know with a big move like that, we want to send uh, her and her family with our blessing. So this is a gift for that move. And I want to just invite you uh, to join me in praying over Yutha and her family. Uh, when people move, we often say, uh, we send you off with our blessings and uh, please know that we'll always be your church home. And so we want to say a similar thing. We're sending you off with our blessings to this next chapter of your life journey with your, uh, with your, in your home. Uh, and, but we also want to pray for you because a move is hard work. <laughs> so if you'll extend your hand out as you're able, let's just say a prayer together. Gracious and almighty God, God, we thank you for the gift of Youth of Hardman Cromwell in your community and here especially at Trinity Church. We pray for Yutha, for Deborah and their family as they embark on this next chapter of their life together. We pray that you will bless their household and all of the ups and downs of moving, of merging households. Uh, we pray that the Holy Spirit will give them patience and kindness, <laughs> love with one another, and help them to know that they are surrounded by this cloud of witnesses that loves and supports and encourages them. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I invite you to be seated. And at this time, I want to invite our children uh, to come and join me for our children's time. Are those who are feeling young at heart today? Don't all run up at once, guys. All right. So children's time is one of my very favorite times in church. And one of the things that I love to do during children's time, you can come up a little closer, come on. No, okay, you, all right, you stay where you are. <laughs> Hi, Walt. I like to share a story from my very favorite book, the Bible. And I want to tell you a story today from the Bible about Jesus. Have you guys heard of Jesus? So Jesus is kind of like the main character in the Bible. <laughs> And I want to tell you a story today about what kind of person Jesus was. I know, there's some cool ferns here. I'm sitting here between two ferns, if you understand that reference. Oh, more people got that reference than I thought. <laughs> All right, so I want to tell you a story today about what kind of person Jesus was. Do you guys see this picture here? Who do you see in this picture here? Yeah, it's a sick little girl. Now, there was a sick little girl who had been sick for a very long time. And she had been so sick that her parents were really worried about her and her health, and they didn't know if she was gonna be okay. And her dad in particular, his name was Jairus, he was so worried about his little girl. When you've been sick, have your parents been worried about you before? Yeah, and they'll try to take care of you, right? Will they bring you like soup and like, you know, give you kisses and stuff, right? Come on, children, I know I've done that for you guys. <laughs> well, this little girl's dad, Jairus, was so worried about their daughter that he was going to try to do anything that he could to make sure that he could take care of her. So he ran and tried to find help. But, you know, at that time, there was no ambulances. And Jairus heard that if he found Jesus, Jesus might be able to help his little girl. So Jairus ran all the way across town where he heard that Jesus was, and he came to Jesus, he was all out of breath, and he's like, do you think you could help my little daughter? And what do you think Jesus said? Jesus said yes, because that's the kind of person Jesus was. So Jesus said yes, and so Jesus went with Jairus all the way back to the house, and Jesus saw the little girl, and he said, this little girl is going to be okay. And he helped raise her up. And do you know what happened? She woke up and she was better. That's one story of Jesus. All right, now in the same story, 
Who do you see here? There was an old woman who had been very sick for a long time. She had been sick for 12 years. Can you imagine being sick for that long? How old are you guys? 10, 12, 10. That means your whole life she had been sick. And she had started to lose hope because she didn't think anybody was going to be able to help her. But then she heard about this person named Jesus and that Jesus cared for people who were sick and Jesus wanted to help people who were sick. So she heard of Jesus and so she went to find Jesus and she thought, if I just touched the hem of his cloak, then maybe I would feel better. And so she found Jesus, she touched the hem of his cloak, and what do you think happened? She was healed. In these stories, we can see that Jesus cared so much for people who were sick. He wanted to make sure this little girl who was sick would feel better, and this old woman who had been sick for a long time would also find healing. And today we're going to talk about some of these stories as we get to know Jesus a little bit better. All right? All right, let's say a prayer together. Can you guys put your hands together? Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are a God that loves us and especially cares for us when we are sick or when we are struggling. We pray like the little girl and the old woman that found healing through you, that when we are feeling sick, when we are feeling discouraged, that we can know that you don't forget about us and that you love us always. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seats. Good morning. morning. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew uh, chapter 9, verses 9 through 13 and 18 through 26. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collector station, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. 
And as he sat at dinner in, that, in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that moment. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout all of that district. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. And happy anniversary of Reconciling Sunday. <laughs> I have to say, it is um, especially lovely to be preaching this Sunday as I um, am deeply grateful to be in a church that welcomes me to the pulpit a queer woman there are still many spaces in which that cannot happen and is so with um, a special joy that i get to be up here and preach this sunday so today we continue our pentecost sermon series i will pour out my spirit on all people last week pastor grace spoke about how the spirit invites us into the disciplines of devoting ourselves to the teaching of the apostles, fellowship, breaking bread and prayer. And today we are gonna look at where our scriptures call us to go once we have received that spirit. What do we do now that the spirit is present with us? How might we live into our faith by listening to where the spirit might call us to go and follow. Our gospel reading today that Mary just read us so beautifully shows the go and follow story of Matthew. Matthew is sitting there doing his job as a tax collector when Jesus passes by and says, follow me. And what does Matthew do? He immediately follows him, drops his job, walks up, with Jesus just like that. Now, I don't know if you noticed, because this is the first time I have, Jesus, while he says, follow me to Matthew, ends up following Matthew to Matthew's house. It is here Jesus meets and dines with Matthew's friends who are tax collectors and sinners. Our scripture says, as he sat at dinner in the house, Many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with Jesus and his disciples. Jesus, while disrupting Matthew's day-to-day -day life by calling him to come and follow out of his job, out of his role, his everyday life, by inviting him to follow Jesus, turns around and immediately follows Matthew to Matthew's context, to his home, to simply eat with his friends. It is Jesus who ends up following Matthew to those sinners. Jesus' leadership in our stories today is one of servant leadership, one where it is Jesus who does the going and the following, where Jesus doesn't teach or lead, but simply sits down for dinner with a group of people and meets them where they are. 
tax collectors at the time of the Bible were folks who could be Roman or sometimes Jewish who were hired by the Roman Empire to tax these Jewish communities. The tax collectors were thought of as supporters of Roman occupation that was so harmful to the Jewish people in the region. Not only were tax collectors reviled due to their working in the government, but they were known for their wealth and power. For the wealth, be it the payments from the job or charging more for taxes than was really actually due to the Roman Empire, that was being taken from this community that they lived in. So here we are a reviled man named Matthew, who Jesus calls, who Jesus follows, follows him to sinners and tax collectors and hated people. And yet, at the same time, they're too low to, on the Roman military rank to be welcomed into that community. So while sinners and tax collectors, their wealth and status and job has made them outcasts and outsiders to both the community which they live in, but also the one they work for. I will pour out my spirit on all people. I think this passage is fascinating because I think a lot of the times I do this too, we talk about our Bible and the stories that are filled with stories of God coming to the oppressed, to the outcast, to the sick, to those who have been looked over by communities and those on the ends of society, bringing comfort to the lowly, of the sick who can't get healed, of widows who need justice, of the poor in spirit, of the Egyptians fleeing the enslavement. Yet here, Jesus ministers to the wealthy, to those who actively oppress through their job, through their working for the Roman Empire, through the corruption of tax collectors we're sometimes known for. Jesus knows the kingdom of heaven can't happen without these folks too. After all, he responds to the Pharisees' deep surprise by saying, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, for I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. He has come not for those who already know God and God's ways, but for those who need help finding it. And how does he do it? He does so by following Matthew, following him into his home to his friends, in eating dinner, what I imagine was probably the best meal he had had in a long time. We don't hear Jesus teach to them. The radical act is just sitting with them, being present and listening, in building relationships, in meeting them where they are, in aligning himself not just with the poor and lowly, but also with the tax collectors, with a people, a part of the Roman Empire, oppressing the lowly, that Jesus' kingdom can't be without powerful and powerless working for it. And he doesn't work to change them, yet. He doesn't preach for them, he just eats. He shows up exactly where they are and ministers to them in the way that they can hear it in the moment. He goes and follows. And then moments later, Jesus is off again. But once again, going and following the community and the leaders present there. In this second part of the scripture, this leader comes running in and kneels at Jesus' feet. My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus goes up and followed him. And when Jesus came to the leader's house and saw these flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he says, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laugh at him. But when the crowd had been put aside, he went in and he took her by the hand and the girl got up. Jesus is once again led into another space. And not only that, he is told by this leader exactly how to minister to her. 
The leader just told him, lay your hand on her so that she might live. So Jesus lays a hand on her, and she gets up and lives. In both these stories, we see Jesus being the one to go and follow. The way he transforms and lives out his faith is by being present to those who invite him into it, who ask for his help, who know their community and tell him exactly where they need his help and his work. Jesus ministers by listening and then going and following. I think our scripture today invites us to think about who we are as people who have already had the Spirit poured out into us, and to think about how we as a church might minister. Are we Matthews, waiting for someone to call us out of our current life and into something new and different? Or are we the group of tax collectors, not quite ready to leave our jobs and our wealth behind, but longing for connection and community and the hope that Jesus brings us? Are we the leaders showing Jesus exactly where our hurt and our sick are and what needs to be done, but needing Jesus' power to do that healing and that work? Or are we the girl presumed dead and yet through Jesus, life is created anew? And how can all of us be more like Jesus, going and following where those around us welcome us and ask us to go, looking for where Jesus might be leading us next or following us next? I know if I'm being honest, I'm more often not a part of the group of tax collectors, sitting at my booth, making my money, looking forward to my fancy community with my, di- with my community who looks very similar to me and thinks very much like me. In fact, this weekend, as we celebrate our reconciling at anniversary as Pride Weekend continues, I think of the many friends who see the work I do here in a church similar to the light of a tax collector. For these friends, it's not about me, it's not about Trinity Church, but it's about this capital C church, the way in which historically churches have interacted with LGBTQIA folks and others who have been historically and deeply harmed by the church. It's about generations and continued harm the institutions of organized religion have caused, of the vocal harm that the loudest Christians do and that we as Christians are the ones leading the charge of harmful laws, or that those who are often have Christian identities. My participation in the church as a queer woman confuses them and honestly sometimes upsets them. To see my job as a part, they see my job as part of the problem. I am a tax collector of the church to them, and I spend much of my time with them apologizing on behalf of the church. I hope in my life I can live more like Jesus, to say, hey, come and follow me, to those who might be different from me, to those who might even be responsible, whether in work, in action, or in words for harming those I love, not to distance myself from them, but to intertwine myself with them, to love them, to follow them to their tables, not to participate in the harm they cause, but to listen to their laments, to meet them where they are so that we together might know how to create the kingdom of God and work alongside each other. To align myself with the widows and the hurt and the sick and the tax collectors, to find places to minister to them because God pours out the Spirit on all people. To go and follow in the community, to listen where the needs of our community are, to follow those who have been there far longer than I have to do what they need to bring wholeness into our community with our missional partners who know exactly where the harm and the problem is and exactly what we might do to fix it. 
I will pour out my spirit on all people. And so, as the school year wraps up, as many of our jobs slow down, or at least we can convert them into a virtual fashion for a little bit, as many of us head off onto our summer vacation to new places or return to old places we have been far away from for a while, as we as a church continue to plan for the launch of celebrating 250 years of Trinity, may we see where Jesus is following us to create God's kingdom in all the places we go with all the people we meet. May we intertwine ourselves not just with the meek and lowly, but with the powerful. May we listen to where the leaders and communities are telling us to heal. May we go out and find new life in Jesus. And may we go and follow as leaders, bringing Jesus into all the spaces we travel. Amen. Um, every week during this series, we have been hearing about the ways in which the Spirit has been present in our lives and as a church and the congregation. Um, and so it is my joy to get to introduce Ashley Parker, who's going to share um, her testimony about the reconciling ministries and some of the justice work Trinity has been up to. So Ashley, thank you for sharing today. Happy anniversary and happy pride. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this month is the eighth anniversary of Trinity becoming a reconciling congregation and whether it is by design or coincidence, our anniversary falls during the month of pride and pride is holy. Um, yesterday was the Capitol Pride Parade and for the third year, Trinity members marched with a contingent of United Methodists from the DC metro area from the Virginia Annual Conference and the Baltimore Washington DC Conference. Um, individuals, congregations, over 100 United Methodists joined together yesterday to march in the parade. We marched with our queer siblings, um, with ourselves, with, with allies and clergy, um, the first time I went to Pride, I went with, with queer friends, and I didn't know what to expect, but there was no way to describe it other than holy. Um, when I marched for the first time last year with siblings from Trinity, I could see that they too felt that shine of holiness. When we joined yesterday, we shared communion, we waved our flags, we woo-hooed <laughs> until we were hoarse. People wore their sh church logos like Alva is wearing today. Uh, people wore their token straight friend t-shirts, their uh, gender affirming healthcare t-shirts. They were a witness. Clergy wore collars, kids handed out candy to anyone who made eye contact with them. And nobody in the world has more joy handing out candy to a screaming mob than Alva does. <laughs> I will say, Alva beamed several people in the head with Skittles. And, and every few minutes I'd have to look behind me because I couldn't find her because she was shaking hands, high-fiving, giving hugs to everyone. I think she got caught up in the uh, UCC contingent at some point and had to run to catch up with us. But that's the joy of being at Pride. Um, the Holy Spirit is at work throughout all of this to see and be amidst our siblings who are the full spectrum of God's humanity, the uniqueness and individuality of every one of them. It is God bursting at the seams. And as many of us know, this is a tough time in the United Methodist Church. The denomination is at a breaking point. We have had literally thousands of individual churches leave the denomination in the past four years over the issue of LGBTQ plus inclusion. 
um, the overwhelming majority leaving because they don't think that our queer siblings belong in this space. And eight years ago, Trinity took a stand against that. We said, we know, we know that every single person is a beloved child of God. We know that each of us are fearfully and wonderfully made, that being gay or bi or ace is not a sin, that being trans or non-binary is not a mistake. We know that we are all made in the image of God. And we made that statement to ourselves, to our community, and to the church at large. We are on a registry of churches that have made that statement. And anyone looking for an affirming church sees Trinity on that list. And that statement was a huge step. And if you want to know more about how it came to be, Mary Beth and Jeff are wonderful resources to tell you the struggle, the pain, and the joy of going through that discernment process. But that was just one step. And taking uh, part in events like the Pride Parade is one step. It's a way for us to bear witness to the beloved kingdom of God, to correct the lies that Hannah called our attention to, that other people say. They say they speak for God, they say they speak for the church, and they spread lies about God's love and our love for our siblings. So taking part in events like Pride is a way for us to live out the vows that we made eight years ago. And so as we celebrate our reconciling anniversary today, as we have a party out uh, on the patio and have ice cream after worship, uh, we recommit to those vows that we made eight years ago. We recommit to being a community that affirms ourselves and our siblings, that recommits to affirming the sacred worth and the human worth of every single one of our siblings. And as we look forward to the next one year, five years, eight years, as we get ready to celebrate our 250th anniversary, we look forward to the ways that the Holy Spirit will continue to work through us and through Trinity as we continue to, to build the beloved kingdom of God. Thank you. Uh, you'll see today on the uh, inside back cover of your bulletin, uh, Trinity's uh, welcoming statement. It's actually in our bulletin every week, but you may not have uh, noticed it. And I just want to read that aloud for us. This was the welcome statement that uh, Trinity adopted when we became a reconciling congregation eight years ago. And I think it's worth us reaffirming it and hearing it. So let me read it aloud for us. Trinity United Methodist Church is committed to be a congregation of open hearts, open minds, and open doors. We believe all people are of sacred worth and dignity as part of God's creation and as demonstrated by the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. As God's love extends to all, we welcome everyone without exception, regardless of age, race, ethnicity, gender, family structure, socioeconomic or marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, physical or mental ability, faith history or life experience. We recognize that we are all different, and those differences make us a stronger community of faith as we worship together to grow in our relationship with God and with one another. So we reaffirm that statement today as we celebrate our reconciling congregation. Uh, like Ashley said, after our worship today, we invite you, the Social Justice Committee invites you uh, to celebrate that together uh, on our, um, our, our entry, Plaza Area, uh, uh, as we continue in our worship. Friends, as we continue in our worship today, I want to share just a few announcements in the life of our church. Uh, first, I want to let you know uh, the beautiful flowers that you see on the altar are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Sandra Pappas, who is uh, the sister of uh, Linda Cancellari, our wonderful music director. 
And then the flowers on the narthex and some of the flowers you'll see along here as well are given to the glory of God in celebration of the wedding of Kelly Merchant and Joe Palazzolo, which was held uh, here uh, yesterday. So we uh, welcome the and celebrate with the Merchant family. We also want to let you know, last year we had shared the, um, the death of uh, one of our beloved Trinity members, Verna Lomax. Uh, I want to let you know that a service of death and resurrection is going to be held for Verna on Saturday, July 15th, next month at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll share further information as it's forthcoming, but we wanted to share that date with you all. I know we um, have been grieving for the death of Verna and finding a way to be able to recognize and honor her life. So we invite you to mark that on your calendars. I want to turn your attention to the bulletins and announcements that you'll see in your bulletin today. Uh, this week uh, it will be the Virginia Annual Conference. If you didn't grow up in the Methodist Church, that is an annual gathering of United Methodist churches, clergy, and delegates from around Virginia. We gather each year for a time to worship together, to ordain clergy, to do some of the business work of the church. Uh, we're going to be gathering this week in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, there's a number of people here from Trinity who are going to be representing Trinity and the district, uh, Yutha, myself, uh, Tom Tyler, uh, Ashley Parker, Lynn Studeman. Uh, we have delegates from our church that represent Trinity, and then we have some district delegates that are going as well. As we return from annual conference, we would uh, be happy to share uh, what's happening in the annual conference. As you know, we have a new bishop this year, so uh, it's an exciting time for us to be able to gather together and hope for and vision for uh, the future of the denomination. Uh, we also want to let you know uh, our youth have been hard at work preparing for their mission trip this summer uh, to the Appalachia Service Project. Uh, that week is going to be uh, the, week, the first week of July, July 2nd through 9th. Uh, I think we have 22 people from our church who are going to be spending a week in home building mission to make homes safer, drier, and warmer. Uh, we, they are doing some last minute uh, fundraising to make sure uh, we have enough money for the vans and all the other supplies that we need for that trip. On your way out today, before you get ice cream, stop by the ASP table. They're doing a little last minute fundraising. Uh, if you haven't been able to contribute yet and would like to be able to way to support our youth and what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, uh, please visit that table and find a way to support that missional work. Uh, finally, I want to let you know in the month of July, we're going to do be doing a sermon series called Joseph the Dreamer. We're going to step into the shoes of Joseph, who uh, uh, was a dreamer with a very dysfunctional family who also dressed really well. He had a colorful coat. <laughs> We're going to have some fun in the month of July, stepping into the story of Joseph. It's going to be very interactive. We're going to invite children to participate with us. We're going to have Wednesday night activities and dinners. Uh, so we want to invite you to join us. Uh, I know people are in and out this summer, but this is going to be a wonderful program and ministry. Uh, uh, as we, we're, we're calling it a deconstructed BBS for everyone, not just for children, but for adults too. We're all going to step into the shoes and the coat of Joseph this summer, and we hope that you will join us for that. As we continue in our worship, we come to the time uh, where we offer our gifts and offerings before God. Uh, there's three ways to give here at Trinity. You can give via uh, Breeze, our online portal. You can give by text, or as the offering plates come before you today, you can place your offering in the offering plates. Uh, as a reminder, if you could fill out your connection cards and place in the offering plates as well, we would appreciate that. We invite our ushers to wait upon us at this time.
I invite you to stand as you are able. <sighs> riches we bring this offering. Help us to use it for the furtherance of your purpose in this place and for the benefit of those in need. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing together our closing hymn, O Spirit of the Living God. the benediction a reminder to stop by the ASP table and then you can get a little reward and get some ice cream at our reconciling reception receive now this benediction children of God go forth from this place to go and follow to be like Jesus who cared for all of God's creation as we celebrate and affirm 
that God's spirit has been poured upon all people, even in the ringing of cell phones. <laughs> May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen.